Okay, um, maybe to start off, you're okay if I pray and then we'll, we'll mm -hmm. talk. Loving God, um, as we look at this uh, important issue, um, in many ways, it's something that uh, we've grown up with. It's the water that we swim in. It's hard to see from a perspective. So I pray that you'll open our eyes and help us to see things in a new light um, so that we can be better followers of you, um, uh, better agents of shalom in uh, this very broken world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, so, first of all, for those who have never encountered it before, I think my laptop doesn't want to f advance. There we are. Uh, most people I've seen there would be familiar with INF, but in case you're not, just a really quick overview of uh, INF and what we do. Uh, INF International Nepal Fellowship, uh, Nepal's oldest NGO, nearly 70 years old now. Um, our motto is life in all its fullness for Nepal's poor and disadvantaged. Um, our work in Nepal has mainly two facets. One is um, health work through hospitals like the one in that photo there, um, Green Pastures Hospital in Pokhara. Um, uh, and that deals, uh, treats people with uh, leprosy, spinal cord injury, um, hearing difficulties, um, other disabilities, um, aims to give people uh, a new life and some dignity in life. Um, the other aspect of INF's work is uh, development work in some of Nepal's uh, most remote and poorest communities. Um, that mainly happens through self-help groups, focuses on things like women's empowerments and education programs and things like that. Uh, if you'd like to know more, plenty of info at the INF website, inf.org.au. Okay, let's move on. Um, now tonight, hopefully it will only be maybe half an hour of input from me, maybe a bit less, um, I hope, and then plenty of time to share ideas and to talk it through. Um, some people might be a long way down this path. Some people might never thought about this issue too much. So uh, it'd be good to share each other's um, insights and input into that. Um, actually, before we go into that quote there, I just want to share a story just to kick things off. Um, this is quite old now. It's, it's, uh, it's decades old story, but it's very fresh in my mind. Um, the, uh, the house next, to, next door to us, uh, the people sold up and moved out. A guy in probably in his early 30s, I guess, bought the house. And I uh, uh, can't remember his name. I remember that he was some sort of tradie. He used to always drive around in his ute. Uh, got to know him a little bit. Uh, he kind of styled himself a bit more as like an up and coming property developer. Uh, and as I got to know him, it became obvious that he wasn't really planning to hang around in Seven Hills for very long. Uh, he bought the house as an investment. He was doing it up so he could sell it and had uh, designs to move to a nicer suburb and uh, uh, etc. cetera. Um, one day when I was out the front, uh, this beautiful shiny yellow Porsche Carrera pulled up and parked outside in the street. And uh, this guy hopped out. And uh, so as he walked up to the house, I just called out, where did you steal that from? And uh, he said, uh, oh, this is my toy. And I said, well, I've never seen you drive it, drive it before. And he said, no, oh, no, I don't normally drive it around here. Um, it's garaged in Castle Hill. Um, I only take it out a few times a year for a run um, because I'm too scared that it's going to get stolen or scratched or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, so we were talking about it a little bit. And uh, then at that moment, someone else drove up and started turning around the corner and this guy froze and I could see his eyes tracking this neighbor's car as it came around the corner and he couldn't relax until this car had gone past his yellow Porsche. <laughs> and then we could keep talking after that. Um, but it occurred to me that uh, it didn't seem like this guy was really enjoying this toy of his. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. He probably worked his backside off and maybe taken out quite a large loan to be able to buy this thing. Um, this dream car. Um, I suspect that he was probably paying a small fortune um, each year just to insure it. And it seemed to me that he was so paranoid about it getting dinged or stolen that he didn't even have a chance to really enjoy it. Um, and it made me wonder, you know, we talk, call these things material possessions, but it made me start to wonder, you know, um, do we possess them or do they actually possess us? Um, 
not long after that, uh, this conversation, I remember watching the news and it got to the finance report and there was someone, might have been Alan Kohler or someone like that, talking about the state of the economy. And uh, just one stage casually referred to ordinary Australians like us as consumers. And I'd probably heard that many times before, but it really leapt out at me and I did a bit of a dummy spit. Um, I thought, oh, is, is that us really? That sums me up, that one word, I'm a consumer. Um, even though that I might um, sign on to a different story, um, basically um, in a globally dominant story of stuff, my whole purpose is boiled down to just that, I exist to buy stuff. Doesn't matter if I'm uh, bear the image of the creator of the universe, doesn't matter if I'm called to co-create and explore and invent and nurture the earth, Basically, I've got to lay all that aside and just go shopping. And that started me on this journey of thinking about this idea of consumerism. Um, apparently, incidentally, I'd say that, um, well, two things. First of all, consumerism, I'm just going to point out that it is an ism uh, in the same way that um, Catholicism or Hinduism or uh, communism or capitalism, it's an ism. It's a story. Um, on which we can base our lives. It's a story that gives us, or purports to give us answers to uh, what, what's the good life? What is our role here on this earth? Um, what are we called to do? Um, so it's just as much an ism as, as all of those other ones. Um, apparently shopping isn't just the key to a contented life. It's also the answer to a lot of crises that we face in our modern world. Um, you might remember George W. Bush after 9-11 telling Americans to go out and shop. Um, uh, it was the answer to coming out of the GFC was to stimulate economies and get people out shopping. Um, you've probably heard it like I have uh, many times that um, it's also the answer to uh, getting things back on track after coronavirus. So it's the solution to global pandemics as well. So it's a, it's a panacea and uh, it's an all encompassing story. I guess it's my job to try and convince you of that as we go. Um, I'm going to quote from this guy a little bit tonight, uh, Victor Liebau, who said this in 1955, just when TV was starting to take over America, very early days in terms of advertising and marketing, uh, but he had this to say, um, the greater the pressures upon the individual to conform to safe and accepted social standards, the more does he tend to express his aspirations and his individuality in terms of what he wears, drives, eats, his home, his car, his pattern of food serving, his hobbies. These commodities and services must be afforded to the consumer with a special urgency. That seems quite prophetic nowadays to me. Um, so what is consumerism? Um, I got a definition from Wikipedia, the authority on everything. Um, it said consumerism is a social and economic order that encourages an acquisition of goods and services in ever increasing amounts. So uh, it's an economic order. Uh, and yes, it's that idea of acquiring stuff in ever increasing amounts. Um, I just want to say, first of all, that I want to draw a distinction between consumerism and consumption. Um, unless you want to try living off the grid, and going totally self-sufficient, obviously we're gonna to have to buy stuff. We need food, we need clothing, we need transport, we need all of those things that go into modern life. Um, so I'm not saying stop buying things, uh, but I wanna draw a distinction between consumption and consumerism. Uh, again, that emphasis an ism of a, a dominant story. Um, and the other thing that's probably worth saying too is that it's not a call to be totally stingy as well. Um, I believe that there should be time in life for celebrations and for special things as well. Um, so I don't, I'm not calling us all to, um, you know, uh, uh, wear sackcloth and, uh, and become a hermit, even though it's easy at the moment to do that. Um, uh, you know, spoil yourself occasionally, spoil your friends, be generous and celebrate. Um, okay, uh, just a little video. I hope this plays okay. Let's see how this goes. The experiment will last your entire life. Don't worry. It's quite painless. You will assimilate certain messages. And these will alter your perception of the world. Permanently. We'll tell you what to wear, what to eat, what to do, what to want. 
important issues will affect you less. You will instead become obsessed by whatever we choose. No need to sign anything. We've already started. Did that play okay? Yep. Yep. Right. Yes. Um, you yes. might have seen that before. Uh, has anyone ever watched Gruen, Gruen Transfer or Gruen Planet, oh, yeah. uh, which yeah. looks at uh, the marketing industry? Uh, the scary thing about that is that that was from their section, you know, the segment they call The Pitch, where they get people in from an advertising agency to produce an ad. And that was the advertising agency producing an anti-advertising ad. Um, so that's from an insider's viewpoint of advertising. Um, it's quite uh, Orwellian and sinister, isn't it? Um, but uh, I just wanted to show that to make the point that for us, consumerism is the water that we've swum in since we were born. Um, so whether you're watching TV, listening to the radio, or you're on the bus, or you're on the internet, um, on your phones, reading newspapers and magazines, wherever you are, we live in a totally marketing saturated world. Um, and all our lives we've bombard been bombarded with messages that say, if you really want happiness and fulfillment, then you've got to have this. Um, depending on where you go, the estimates of how many ads we're exposed to is something between 20 and 40,000 ads a year. Uh, so we really are hammered by it. Um, and I guess the question is, does it work on us? And I'd say, well, if you've got to, got to look at our society and say, of course it works. Um, uh, that's why the highest paid psychologists and creative thinkers and artists and filmmakers, I'm not saying they're necessarily the best, but the highest paid ones all work in advertising and marketing. Um, I saw a recent report from PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, said that the advertising sector grows at a steady rate, annual growth rate of 7.8% per annum, which is way faster than the rest of the economy. And uh, it forecasts that spending in marketing in Australia will hit $23 billion by 2023. So it's a big part of our life. It's a big, uh, a big uh, uh, money spinner. Um, just show you another video that's a few years old now, but um, you might find this interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Advertising is everywhere. Marketers are being challenged to find new and innovative Their messages stand out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do they really know what's cutting through? And how far will they go to find out? Yeah, 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 yeah. Advertisers are now teaming up with neuroscientists for answers. They're using brain imaging technology to literally look inside our heads. In the hope of selling a brand or message, advertisers are turning to a new field called neuromarketing. Neuromarketing is actually giving us the first look at, at an objective measure of, of consumer responses that isn't filtered from their more rational side of their brains. Dr Moon is using electroencephalograms, or EEGs, to measure the brain's electrical activity while a subject watches a TV ad. Everybody's searching for someone. What we're doing is recording from multiple sites on the brain. We typically use 40 to 64 sites, and that captures a, a lot of the information across the brain. They also record eye-tracking information so they can see exactly which part of the screen the subject is watching at any given time. We're then able to uh, go back and look at the eye-tracking overlaid with the specific ads, tied in with the specific brain activity recording to then feed back to our client. What we're seeing here, Marianne, is the recording from each of the electrode sites and then what we're seeing here is a, a brain model of the recordings uh, so that we can actually then start to understand which areas of the brain are being activated. Yellow is the stronger activation, um, the darker the colour is the less activation, so that's what we want to see. Advertising veteran Don Jeffrey believes we need to know what motivates someone to buy a product. If we can capture and understand 
the emotions of the people that are buying our product, then our advertising is going to be far more effective. And if we want to hold in market share, we've got to put messages out there and convince people that they're doing the right thing buying our client's product. I hope you caught that bit that he said at the end. First of all, and if we want to stop and check himself, hold our market share, then we've got to put messages out there to convince people that they're doing the right thing, buying our clients' products. A bit of a, uh, a moral aspect to, to advertising and consumerism there. Um, you know, back in the good old days, uh, marketing firms would get a focus group together and they'd show them a bunch of different ads and ask them, you know, how did that act, ad affect you? But probably for the last 15, 20 years, they've realised it's much more effective to bypass our rational brains and appeal to our more sort of primal areas of our brains because they know that that's where the impulses that drive our behaviour stem from. Um, and so basically marketing advertising is very sophisticated, it's very well resourced, and it's there to convince us of basically a story that says that. What's the purpose of our life? We need to work, we need to buy stuff, and we need to consume stuff. Um, and it will claim to tell us that that's uh, what's going to lead to a rich and rewarding life for us, and that's what's best for the world around us. Um, so what's wrong with that is my question. Uh, you know, what's, what, why don't we just go with the ride? Why don't we get out there and do some retail therapy? What's wrong with consumerism as a dominant story? Um, a helpful way of looking at it, I don't know if you've ever seen this diagram. You've probably seen or heard something like it. Um, that comes from a, uh, originally from uh, an idea developed by Bryant Myers in a book called Walking with the Poor. Um, and it was his answer ultimately to what poverty is. And, uh, and so uh, here's this diagram that talks about um, our four vital relationships. Uh, so uh, as you can see, they're the most important vital relationship. I don't know if my pointer comes up on your screen. Um, that vertical relationship between us and God, um, that our fundamental re relationship is with the creator of the universe. Um, but of course, God being um, invisible and intangible, that relationship tends to be played out horizontally. And so it, it uh, expresses itself in our relationship with ourself, um, in our relationship with others, and with our relationship with creation. Um, and that is taken, you know, quite significantly from uh, texts like um, Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and... Uh, he extends it and says that uh, in any culture, those relationships um, start getting expressed in systems that make, uh, you know, uh, life livable. And so to help us in our, um, our, our calling to, uh, I've heard someone say, co-create and procreate, um, we uh, set up these economic and social and religious and political systems. And the purpose of those systems is to create um, a state it's a beautiful word that you might be familiar with from Hebrew, um, a state of shalom, a state of well-being where everything and every person in creation can flourish. Um, so that's a very quick uh, summary of, of that uh, creation story. Um, so seen a diagram like that somewhere along the lines or have heard mm. of a concept like that? I assume so. Yeah. Um, of course, we know how the story goes, unfortunately. Um, and uh, you've only got to read on a bit in Genesis, fooled into believing that we can't trust God. We choose to set ourselves up as gods, to choose good and evil, to choose what's right for us and for everyone else. Um, and so because that vertical relationship becomes, um, uh, if not broken, then it's certainly um, uh, polluted by this pervasive sense of guilt and fear and shame. That starts playing itself out in horizontal relationships. So even our relationship with ourself uh, becomes broken. And uh, so it leads to what uh, Bryant Myers called a poverty of being. Um, and our relationship with other human beings leads to a poverty of community. Where communities are broken. And uh, instead of trust and cooperation, there's um, competition and, and uh, mistrust, etc. cetera. Um, and our relationship with creation is broken as well. Um, and so our relationships with others and with creation, they tend to become self-seeking seeking and exploitative and abusive. And those systems, which are really relationships that are created to exist for Shalom, now become twisted um, 
to become uh, uh, more in favour of rich and powerful people and at the expense of weak and vulnerable people. So that's a very quick introduction to those diagrams and to that concept of um, maybe a biblical perspective on uh, our broken world as it is today. Um, so, um, uh, and in that sense, uh, we could have a look at, and we're going to have a look at consumerism and maybe critique it um, from the viewpoint of these fundamental relationships and from this biblical story of uh, what some people would know maybe is creation and fall. Um, so let's have a look at it, let's break it down a bit. Um, the first thing I want to look at is um, poverty of being. How does economic, or uh, sorry, does, um, how does consumerism uh, express this poverty of being that we just talked about? Um, have you seen that famous quote somewhere? Mm -hmm. um, very famous, Nelson Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. How much money does a man need to be happy? Just a little more. Uh, here's a wonderful quote from um, a fantastic book by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs that I would recommend to read, The Great Partnership. Um, he says, the consumer society directed at making us happy achieves the opposite. It encourages us to spend money we do not have, to buy things we do not need for the sake of happiness that will not last. I'm thinking about my neighbour with his Porsche. By constantly directing our attention to what we do not have, instead of making us thankful for what we do have, it becomes a highly effective system for the production and distribution of unhappiness. I think that's quite a profound insight there. Mm -hmm. but one thing that consumerism, because it's driven by marketing, uh, and for marketing to work, it has to convince us of a lack in our life. But rather than our attention being on the things that we have and the things we have to be thankful for, um, it's actually directing our attention to uh, things that, uh, that we might be convinced that we need or that we want instead. So it actually produces in us not a sense of satisfaction, but a sense of dissatisfaction and a sense of unhappiness. And I think that's borne out in some of the social metrics uh, in Australia alone. So here's just three. Um, people are often shocked when I give this statistic and it's a quite a tragic one. A lot of us are actually have been affected by this. Do you know that suicide is the leading cause of death for under 45s in Australia? And in fact, when you take out, um, uh, it, when you just look at non-medical causes, it's the largest cause of death for all Australians. Um, to me, that statistic says that there's something fundamentally wrong in our culture. There's some fundamental problem there that we're not addressing and we're not reaching. Australian consumption of antidepressants is the second highest in the OECD, trebled since 2000. Two thirds of Australians are overweight or obese, seventh highest in the OECD. Um, that's just three, there's a whole lot more, but I think there's enough evidence there to suggest that whatever story we're listening to in Australia, and I think it's largely consumerism, um, that it's actually not helping us to thrive as people. Um, it's uh, a great expression, I think, of our uh, poverty of being. Um, it would seem to me that all our wealth, and I don't even know this, do you know that Australia is well, most people living in a developed world now, um, economists tell us this, that we're probably the wealthiest people to ever have existed on the planet. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but um, uh, compare your lifestyle to say, I'm reading a book about uh, Thomas Cromwell at the moment. So Henry VIII features quite heavily, um, King of all England. Um, we live a lifestyle that he would never have dreamt of. Uh, I don't think he had running water, he didn't have flushing toilets. Uh, he didn't have anything he wanted to eat on demand any time of the year. Uh, well, we can't at the moment, but he couldn't hop on a plane and travel to anywhere around the world. Uh, we have a lifestyle that uh, kings of old would never even have dreamt of. Um, and despite all of that, there seems to be this pervasive disconnect and this sense that we're not living the good life. So that's my first problem with uh, consumerism is uh, it doesn't address our poverty of being. What about our poverty of community? How is it helping in terms of our uh, relationships with other people? Um, I don't have time to make the connection, but I think some of the issues we're seeing going on in the United States at the moment, um, there's a definite connection with the story of stuff. Um, and it's interesting that uh, one of the solutions that people see to the problem of, uh, of in racial injustice is to go out looting. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is, um, did they have it, we don't, we're going to help ourselves to it. And that's 
another sad expression of the story of stuff. Um, but does it, how does it lead us in terms of our treatment of, of other people, not only in our communities, but around the world? Um, here's a good uh, quote that addresses that. Um, we've been told a story that casts us in a role of consumers, people who merely take in products that were made far away. The reality is that as human beings, we make choices and the choices we make around what we wear are having profound implications for our planet as well as for some of our most vulnerable fellow human beings. Um, and I've probably only got to show that picture. People would recognize that straight away. Um, the Rana Plaza tragedy in 2013. Um, when our building collapsed, it killed over a thousand garment workers and injured about 2,500. Um, and what it emphasized uh, or what it exposed was um, the way that global trade essentially what it does is it exports manufacturing to countries where labor is cheap, safety and welfare regulations are minimal and environmental controls are non-existent. Um, and even when human trafficking isn't involved or dangerous work places like that, um, people who are familiar with Nepal would know the, um, for example, the social cost of um, so many community members having to migrate for work, traveling to India or to capital cities to, to um, to find work to make a living um, and that's a story that's told in many countries around the world um, so not just in our local communities but in our global community it seems to me that consumerism is exacerbating things it's not an answer to that problem at all so that's uh, poverty of community what about a poverty of stewardship um, is it the answer to looking after the planet um, <laughs> uh, probably not uh, here's Victor Liebau again uh, we require not only forced draft consumption, but expensive consumption as well. We need things consumed, burnt up, worn out, replaced and discarded at an ever increasing pace. We need to have people eat, drink, dress, ride, live with ever more complicated and therefore constantly more expensive consumption. Um, there's the guru of marketing speaking there. What does that cost our world, our planet? What is, what's the impact on the environment? Um, here's a quote that I just read today that I think is an amazing one, an amazing insight. Um, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Um, it's a pretty powerful quote, isn't it? Um, uh, I don't know if you know this, but Australia has the highest per capita carbon emissions in the world. Um, and uh, depending on which global footprint calculator you look at, generally as a rough figure, if everyone in the world lived like a typical Australian, we'd need four Earths to sustain our lifestyle. Um, our throwaway culture is placing huge pressure on the Earth's resources, causing pollution and problems with waste disposal. Um, widespread land clearing and industrial agricultural techniques are causing soil degradation. Habitat reduction is driving ever more species to the brink of extinction. Um, what's driving these environmental crises that we face? Um, I lay it at the feet of our consumerist culture. And probably the most important one of all, um, a poverty of spiritual intimacy. Um, Victor Liebau again. <laughs> our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfactions, our ego satisfactions in consumption. The measure of social status, of social acceptance, of prestige is now to be found in our consumptive patterns. The very meaning and significance of our lives today expressed in consumptive terms. Starting to sound like it's a religion to me. Um, and just to hammer that home, here's an ad you may have seen before. Let's just watch this. This is it. This is what matters. The experience of a product. How will it make someone feel? Will it make life better? 
does it deserve to exist? We spend a lot of time on a few great things until every idea we touch enhances each life it touches. You may rarely look at it, but you'll always feel it. This is our signature, and it means everything. Is it just me, or does anyone else feel like you've just had a religious experience? <laughs> um, let's break it down a bit. Um, here's a few things that I think this ad is promising us if we buy an eye product. Uh, meaning, I think it's promising us um, some identity, um, li certainly lifestyle, status, hope, intimacy, freedom, even morals, um, to be able to judge what's worthwhile and what isn't worthwhile. I think that's all wrapped up in that ad which I think, I can't remember how much it cost, but it was very expensive to produce. But if you take away the ad and look at those words, where do we normally, or where, where, certainly where would Christians say we find those things? Where do we get those things mm. from? Um, mm. And that's my point about uh, consumerism, because I think if you scratch beneath the hyper-reality and the, and the glitter of it, um, it's basically, um, a false story to base our life on and uh, to use the you know biblical terms certainly in the Old Testament it's a form of idolatry it's a false God that promises those things but can't deliver them and I think that's what's driving consumerism is uh, it's uh, that classic trying to stuff that gaping hole in our lives with something and because it doesn't work we just try more and more and more and more um, and so uh, I think that's the case um, uh, when you think about it, um, ads always work on two levels um, and that's the way uh, that they're designed to work. Um, first of all, they sell us a lifestyle or they try and sell us a product by, by selling us a lifestyle. And so we might think the ad doesn't work because I didn't go out and buy a new iPhone, um, but it's got under my skin because it's given me a message about what life is all about and what the good life is. Um, and so, yeah, I would put it to, to everyone that um, I'd suggest that uh, the fundamental problem with consumerism as an ism is that it's actually um, in our culture a replacement for uh, that old fashioned word religion to bind us to God. And I think ultimately it doesn't satisfy, it doesn't provide meaning, identity, hope, intimacy or freedom. In fact, it's actually the opposite when you look at it. So, uh, that's my problem with consumerism. You may or may not agree with some of the stuff that I've said, but that's my reading of it. Um, and I think from that framework of those four um, principal relationships, I think consumerism is our modern culture's answer to those things and attempt to try and um, uh, uh, give us some meaning in life, but actually just another expression of uh, a poverty of spiritual intimacy, a poverty of being, poverty of community and a poverty of stewardship. Um, so what's the answer to it? Uh, probably as briefly as we can, so we have some time to chat um, very briefly. Uh, this is a very famous passage that most of the audience would be very familiar with, Romans 12, 2. But I'm wondering if what we've just talked about might give it a new light. Um, don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Um, I think what we need to deal with is a new set of eyes and a new way of thinking. Um, if we need to, if we want to try and um, begin to disentangle ourselves from this story of stuff. Um, and I might just finish off, uh, or almost finish off. I'm going to embarrass Diana with a story now about her. Um, she's off screen. Uh, this is again is many, many years ago now. Uh, but I remember one evening when we sat down to eat dinner, um, halfway through eating and you'd be surprised to hear that the telephone rang and despite of us saying don't answer it Diana did and surprise surprise it was a telemarketer who was trying to sell us um, an investment scheme or something like that 
Um, and, uh, you know, so they launched into their sales pitch and Diana was probably too patient, finally found a gap in the conversation to be able to say, um, no, thanks, I'm not interested. And of course, you know, the telemarketers have scripts to follow. And if they say I'm not interested, um, they skip to the next part of the script, which was something like, um, I think she said, we've got enough money to buy, we're not interested. And the salesperson said, wouldn't you like a little extra cash to buy those special things you really want? And Diana, I'm not sure how much thought went into this. I think the main aim was to try and get off the phone as quickly as possible. But Diana kind of just said, I can't think of anything that I really want that money can buy. <laughs> and there was this pause where we couldn't hear it, but I could almost sense the uh, telemarketer flicking back and forward through these sheets of paper, trying to find what am I supposed to say when they say that? They were clearly stunned. And then the only thing I came back with was that actually she asked Diana, do you really mean that? And I think Diana might have been a bit surprised that she said it in the first place. I'm putting thoughts in your head, I don't know. But then thought about it for a second and she said, yes, I do. Um, we had a bit of a conversation later about what are the things we really want? Um, we want a better world. We want a world where everyone can flourish. Um, we want a world where people are whole. Um, and money, no amount of money is going to make that happen. Anyway, now I'm getting this right if I embellish this. Did she hang up on you? I don't remember that. I do remember the conversation kind of ended <laughs> with the telemarketer going, well, thanks very much. Maybe they mutually <laughs> hung up. But I didn't know where to go with it because that was an answer that they just, and the people who prepared the script had never thought of before. Um, they never expected to find someone who actually didn't buy into the story that um, more money and more stuff is what we actually need. Um, so I, I just offered that as an example of, of some kingdom thinking, of thinking a different way and uh, thinking about, well, how can I use my resources and my effort and my energy um, to actually bring more shalom into the world rather than less? And certainly we've always um, reminded each other um, that often those schemes, investments, schemes, extra jobs, um, maybe another investment property, something like that, often means more work, more stress, and actually less time and energy for the things that we really value, like relationships and generosity and community. So that's my case against consumerism. Um, I would argue that uh, if we can restore that vertical relationship between us and God, that that will express itself horizontally um, in our relationship with ourselves and with our communities and with our planet. Um, and that'll lead to a different set of values and a different set of practices that reflect um, God's care for this world. Um, all right. Uh, it'd be really good if we could have a bit of conversation now. So I'll, I'll quit this uh, presentation in a second. Um, except just to say, uh, here are my short headings for some ways we can begin to make some practical steps. Um, and they come under the headings of consuming less, consume better, because we have to consume. Uh, instead of consuming, let's take back our creational mandate. Let's produce something instead um, or create something as an alternative to just a life of consumption. Um, so I'd be interested in packing up some ideas about uh, how can we actually do that. Um, uh, before I uh, do that, though, just a reminder that there's a fair bit of stuff on the resource sheet about that um, at the end of the resource sheet. Uh, there's a bit of a biblical reflection that doesn't answer many questions. It asks questions about two stories from Luke, uh, the story of the rich ruler and the story of Zacchaeus that you can have a bit of a look at. Um, I'd be happy to have some chats with people about that um, another time. Um, and then there's a whole lot of suggested uh, some ideas and some links you can chase up, lots of links you can chase, uh, books for further reading, uh, lots of suggestions for starting to or further exploring this this uh, topic. So I'd recommend that you download that and have a look at that. And a bit of a summary of everything that, that I've just talked about as well. Mm. So maybe I'll stop sharing. And if people want to unmute, well, I think I can unmute everybody, can't I? Well, I just tried to unmute everybody. <laughs> um, People can unmute as they as they go as they go. Uh, Steve, uh, I'm interested. I think I I think it's great 
Um, the resource is great. The presentation is really, really helpful overview. I wonder if there's one word missing from your from your list of responses there, and I wonder if it's something like share. Like, yeah, it would be beautiful. It's, it's implicit in in a lot of what you've said and the stories that you've shared, but I wonder if that's also <laughs> part of. It's not just about consuming less or consuming better or consuming more mindfully um, and then producing and creating, but it, but it is that sense of not living for yourself, but living for God and living for others. And that involves a stance of, sh of, of openness and generosity and open handedness in a way that consumption is about gathering to oneself. Sharing is about spreading out from oneself. Can we put that in the resource stuff? <laughs> we, we should we can do an updated version um people can people can feed back their their thoughts and comments things they would add as well it'd be great great to make be people could share that and we can put it on that resource it could yeah. be a living document that'd be fantastic hmm. any other comments or insights or questions or ideas from other people steve that's great what you've said i would imagine that most of us, if not all of us, would agree wholeheartedly. Um, I guess my question is that much as I agree with that and much as I would want to put all that into practice, how would I go about trying to convince others mm. to think along those lines? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, mm. I guess I would ask, I mean, you know, I, I can't remember how I went with uh, my neighbour with his yellow Porsche. Mm. <laughs> and and often, you know, the front-on approach doesn't really work all that well. Um, some things, what are some ideas that we've done in the past? Um, one thing is, for example, uh, the, the biggest festival of consum consumerism we had Christmas time uh, mm. is to show people a different way of giving. So uh, before, I, it might have been before INF even had gift cards. Um, in fact, it must have been because it was Tier Australia who invented the idea of a Christmas gift catalogue. And so we actually um, gave our family, as well as a present, we thought just a gift card would be maybe a step too far, but as well as a present, we gave them a gift. What did we just, might have been the whole present, I can't remember. But we gave family members goats and uh, wells and chickens mm. and things like that, instead of um, mm. stuff, a CD they didn't want or a tie or something. Mm. And that led to conversations. Well, first of all, a big explanation about how it worked. So where's this goat? <laughs> no, you don't get it. Um, uh, but but it, it's actually led to my family now. Uh, we don't give each other Christmas presents anymore. Every Christmas we'll, you'll get emails going around saying, oh, for Christmas this year, I've given money to Medicine Sans Frontier or to INF. Or, so mm -hmm. on behalf of you, we've decided to be generous to these people. Um, so that's one example. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it really depends on your relationship with that person. Um, just to drop in that little question every now and then about mm. that really helping you, is that actually making you happy? Um, that can be a bit confrontational, I suppose, even just to try and gently say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's good, but, you know, I find that I find this more satisfying. Does anyone else have any great ideas for conversation starters or ways to do that? I think it's it's slowly, slowly, um, and and not shaming people. At, mm. at our church here, we've had a um, a group originally called the Fair Trade Folk, and we we changed our name a few years ago to Just Love. Um, but but it's a group that's been in existence for probably ten years or more now, and started with running market stalls and selling. Um, produce like the INF bags and, and such like, but we, we had things from quite a number of suppliers. Um, getting into those conversations about fair trade and, and justice in, in our consuming. Um, and for many, many years, we found we actually have much better conversations with people in the market stall than we did in our own church. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad mm -hmm. to say that has now turned around. Um, um, and we have very, very good conversations with people uh, in our church as well as outside. Um, the other thing we've done, I'm just looking for the resource, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Baptist World Aid put a resource out uh, probably some five years ago mm. uh, that's primarily about giving, um, 
and about thinking about uh, thinking about how you give and, and where you give and, and making sure that you give with maximum impact, which is the name of the, um, the, the little resource that they put together. Um, so we've been able to run a little program on, on maximum impact um, a number of times. And that also brings in conversations about our, our consumption of all sorts of things. So I think just slowly, slowly talk about why it is that you do things um, without pressuring other people to do the same. The, the Baptist church, and I think it's, it's their um, overseas age uh, section, I forget what it's called, and I forget their website, but they, they have a, um, a rundown on, on where all, all the popular fashion brands are sourced. And yeah, ethical shopping, ethical shopping ethical guide, shopping I think guide. it's called. Yeah. Ethical yeah. shopping, is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's that's, actually, yeah, that's quite good. Cool. And, and, and yeah. they're really making headway. They're getting mm. suppliers to change their yeah. practice, to, to, to treat their workers better, you know. Yeah, and getting a bit of uh, media coverage as well, often mm. when it comes out too. Yeah, so what's it called? Uh, the ethical fashion guide it's on there's a link to it on the resource sheet so if you don't oh, okay good yeah and there's also a much more in-depth one called the ethical shopping guide that looks at groceries and rates them according to um, oh, okay mm -hmm. ethical production and environmental um, mm -hmm. cost, etc as well so there's lots of resources mm -hmm. out there that you can look at to help guide you in terms of what you do um, yeah. and of course in giving gifts if you want to give people some chocolate give them something that's fair trade certified uh, or coffee or tea. They're, they're the diggies um, and they mm. give volumes to people. So that's mm. I think, look, I resonate with what everyone has said. I, I think everybody has a bit of an inkling that something is not right. Like I think everybody has an inkling that part of what we're doing as we get trapped in these cycles is just a self-perpetuating thing, desires that can never be satisfied, that constantly get reignited. Um, and I think deep down, we know it's something about it is not good for, wanting is okay, but a never ending, never you know, fulfilling desire is a sign of something that we can't receive in this world. Um, and there's a hunger there. And so I, I think as well, there's a, if there are ways that you can bring somebody into a moment where they can experience both a little bit of that dissatisfaction, but also something closer to the truth, something closer to justice, mercy and faith, um, where people actually get, you know, so we, we, we were tutoring um, refugee uh, students in Western Sydney for a number of years, my wife and I, and we, we just invited kind of friends and, and so on into tutoring refugee kids with us. And not, uh, not a huge number of people did, but a number of people joined us at different times and, you know, formed relationships with new communities and families and gave their time and their energy to support kids who in many ways uh, just had very little in this world. Um, oh, sorry, one, one slight tangent back to Steve's consumerism celebration at Christmas. One of one of the kids we tutored, a Sudanese girl, she her birthday was December twenty fifth, um, and I remember one year she just talked in delight about how she shared a birthday with Jesus, uh, and how how happy and excited she was that that was the case, and I thought how many Australian kids would actually just be annoyed that they only got you know, their birthday and their Christmas mm -hmm. presents came on the same day. They did two celebrations of consumerism for them during the year. But she, you know, but, but when people, when people have the chance to, to live a life for others, uh, and ultimately, hopefully also for God, they're living the life for others because they want to live their life in service to the God who made those others in his image. Um, I think we get, that's where we find our escape. Um, that we can't just be anti-consumers, we have to be pro something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dave? 
This might be Kerry. This might be what you're looking for. Top ethical. Uh huh. That's the, the Baptist world age. Eh? Is that is what you're meaning? World age? Is that what you're meaning, Steve? That looks like the that's the ethical shopping guide, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Paper ones, and there's an app on your phone you can get as well. Oh, is there? Yeah. Um, although it does make your shopping trips a lot longer because you've made it the app, figuring out whether you should buy that brand of rice or this brand of rice. Just a warning. Um, <laughs> yeah. Take it one product at a time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I avoid mobile phones if I can. <laughs> that's it. <interesting advice. laughs> Um, now, I'm conscious that it's a bit after nine. Uh, people have been mm. for another, you know, few minutes. Um, so I guess that, that does bring up a, a, a good point, and that is that um, when you start looking into this, it can become quite overwhelming, um, especially mm. if you want to try and throw yourself into it and do everything at once. Um, so I guess I'd counsel against going off the grid and growing your own food all in the same month. Um, but there's a lot of steps you can do and just do kind of one thing at a time and things get a bit of a roll. Um, just within those, I'll just quickly run through, put you on that fact sheet so you can um, access them later, but just quickly some ideas that we kind of brainstormed in terms of how to, uh, well, to start off with, to consume less. Um, so to ask, us, ask yourself before you buy something, how do I really need this? How often am I going to use it? Um, would it make more sense to borrow it or to hire it? Um, do I know someone else who might use it? We can go halves and share it. Um, uh, simple things like joining your local library. We have a wonderful local library who uh, during lockdown actually home delivered books, believe it or not. Um, uh, explore, a, you might not like this advice at the moment, but to explore public transport <laughs> or um, ca car hire, taxis, etc. Um, many years ago, Diana's parents, when one of their cars was on its last legs, made the decision when they looked at how much they were driving at that point, um, they were going to get and trade it in, get a new car. And they thought, why, why do we do that for the amount that it, we use it? Um, it's actually going to be cheaper just to run one car and get taxis when we need an extra one. Um, and that was before the days of Uber and go get car sharing, etc. So to think that, you know, a little bit outside the square of whether you actually need it or not. Um, uh, I've got a link on the fact sheet to a couple of local um, repair cafes. Um, so if something's broken, think about taking it to your repair cafe and see if they can fix it for you rather than just throwing it into landfill. Um, and there's also a bit of um, an argument sometimes for um, actually um, uh, buying better things that are less likely to break down so soon. Um, mm which I guess goes into the, the next category, which is consuming better. Um, sometimes it's worth spending a bit more for something that you know is going to last longer and doing your research on that. Um, some of the suggestions we've got for buying things secondhand, eBay, Gumtray, Gumtree, um, Vinnie's and Salvo's. Um, anyone heard of FreeCycle? Anyone members of their local FreeCycle network? Um, that's an email network where people are getting rid of stuff rather than just putting it on the nature strip and hoping someone will take it. They post it on FreeCycle and uh, we've scored some amazing things on FreeCycle. People have been giving away um, bikes. Dana's newest bike we got from FreeCycle for free. Um, stereo systems, a uh, whole lot of lounges, <laughs> uh, whole lots of stuff from FreeCycle. So if you're happy to do that, that becomes very exciting to score that stuff. Um, we love going on shopping sprees to Salvo's. You can certainly enjoy the thrill of the hunt just as much at a Salvo's store as you can at, uh, you know, a top fashion outlet. Um, so uh, that's a lot of fun if you want to consume, but uh, in a less harmful way, I suppose. Um, if you're really hardcore, tried some dumpster diving. I never have. I don't know what that's like in a coronavirus era, but what the heck. Um, uh, Ethically, we talked a bit about that. Uh, there's a few resources on the um, on the sheet there for uh, ethical shopping. Uh, everything from you know tea and coffee and chocolate and etc. Um, fruit and veg. Um, maybe think about joining a co-op. Um, we're part of a veggie co-op. We sort of coordinate a tea and coffee co-op where we buy stuff in bulk from Trade Winds. Um, Diane is now the queen of toilet paper and paper towels and tissues from Who Gives a Crap. 
Um, there are websites that you can look up uh, on the, on the um, sheet if you want to. Um, Steve, can I add something there? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Uplift Fair Trade, is that the shop in the Blue Mountains? That's the one, yeah. That's the one. I follow them on Facebook mm. and they were really badly affected, um, not by the bushfires themselves, mm. but by the impact of the bushfires. They mm. had weeks and weeks and weeks where they were smoke impacted. Um, they were closed for quite a long time. They came very, very close to losing the business. Mm. Um, but because they actually hadn't been impacted by fire, they weren't eligible for any of the government support. Mm. So if any of you are close enough um, or feel like jumping online and supporting them, um, mm. that would be a great little business to, to get behind um, mm. and help them yeah. get back on their feet again. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Um, anyway, uh, lots of stuff there referred to, to resource sheet for, for later consumption. Um, uh, what are some of the other things uh, that I've got there just very quickly? Oh yeah, replace consuming with producing and creating. Um, grow something, grow some food, even if it's just a few tomatoes in a pot, maybe. Um, it's very, very satisfying to eat something that you've grown yourself. Um, so do that. Uh, mm. We've had chooks for many years and I would recommend that to anybody. Uh, there are only pets. Uh, they're not so cute and cuddly, maybe, as a cat or a dog, but um, cats and dogs don't produce eggs you can eat. Um, and fertilise it for your garden, so i uh, recommend that. Um, try baking something, cooking something, uh, knitting something or crocheting. Uh, just create something. The satisfaction that comes from actually, um, you know, uh, fulfilling your creational mandate and, and being a producer of something. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. And of course, during coronavirus time, it's a great time to be uh, either learning or reigniting some of those old skills. Um, and it, that makes me think too, it's probably worth pointing out that um, it's only, I'm showing my age, not too many decades ago when it was actually the norm for people to have fruit trees and a bit of a veggie patch in their backyard. Mm. Very rare to find a backyard that didn't have something that was producing mm. food that you could eat. Um, it's, it's only been the last few decades where we've sort of been pushed into this mode of everything that we need, we just get from the shop. Um, so it's worth maybe developing um, some of those skills. Um, be creative. I'd suggest, you know, learn a musical instrument or uh, um, uh, write something. If you're an artisty person, create some art. Uh, if you're not an artistic person, uh, renovate something, do something up. Uh, anything that's actually, you know, not just uh, I'll buy it, I'll use it, and when it breaks, I'll throw it out. Um, I'd recommend this as a soul restoring exercise. Um, any other ideas that people have along those lines? <laughs> My mum just texted offering strawberry plants to anyone who wants them. See me afterwards. <laughs> All right. We might wrap it up. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. I, I hope this stimulates a bit of thought and a bit of action. And mm. if anything you'd like to share, um, email it in. It's probably the easiest way. You've got our, our email address as part of this whole process. If you've got some strawberry plants you want to share, um, that would be great. Um, if you know any other things that, or ideas or thoughts that we could add to that resource sheet, that'd be even better. Um, and maybe just to finish off with uh, the point that Ben made is that probably um, the most counter consumerist statement you can make is to actually give. Um, and it, it is quite a countercultural thing to do in a way, um, is to be generous. Um, and one of the reasons for, I think, living a bit of a simpler life, uh, one of the reasons for our lifestyle, where both Diana and I work part time, is so that we've actually got more time to do the stuff that we value, community, church, um, that sort of thing. Um, so not just in terms of money, because we're not all awash with money, but with time, uh, just with compassion and friendship in a time like now too. Um, it's uh, quite a countercultural counter thing to develop a giving uh, lifestyle um, mm -hmm. and uh, probably the key to that I think is um, we love because he first loved us um, mm -hmm. probably that 
fundamental relationship, vertical relationship. Um, that the, the challenge to me and the reminder to me is to keep working on that and keep, keep, keep developing that because it mm -hmm. kind of flows naturally horizontally. Um, if you do have some spare money, INF would love to receive it from you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had quite a few requests from the power at the moment. Uh, INF's resources are very stretched there dealing with coronavirus. Um, Nepal's been in shutdown for many weeks and will continue to be into June. Uh, we have connections not just with INF but with plenty of Nepali churches who are struggling to meet the needs of their communities and are dying to do it and just need some resourcing to do it. So uh, I would hardly recommend INF as an organisation to support if you can in the midst of that. Uh, if you're embarrassed by the government giving you job paper when you don't think you deserve it, uh, then you know that's a great way that you can deal with that problem as well. Um, uh, if you've got another organisation like INF that you support, by all means keep doing that uh, as well. But um, yeah, be generous, not just to the families and people close to you in your community, but be generous global citizens as well. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. And, Thanks so much, Ben. That was really good. Yeah. And thought provoking. Cool. Yeah. Um, ben, when's the next one and what is it? Okay. Uh, and next, you put me on the spot. And next one. You're making crazy uh, kids of care, isn't it? In August. Is that right? Well, let me, let me. Yes, there is a webinar in August, which will be the first. Uh, no, no, not the first. Uh, a Monday in August. I'm just waiting for the website to load as I look through. Monday the 24th of August, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, raising kids who care. So we have uh, somebody who's worked extensively in this area and uh, has been done some volunteer work with INF, has worked with Baptist World Aid. Let's give them some more props for tonight. I feel like we probably shouldn't mention other organizations quite as much as we have, but that's just part of our generous sharing nature. But um, Susie Lee will be uh, presenting that one with some amazing kind of insights about just how to, how to be a family, how to nurture children who value what's on God's heart, which, you know, mm -hmm. uh, again, it's hard to go past Micah 6, 8 as a summary of the weighty things that are on God's heart, justice, mercy, and faith, a humble, walk with our Lord that expresses itself in abundant acts of love and kindness and a concern for justice, the conditions in which people live and thrive. Um, so that that's one to watch out for. In between now and then though, because who can wait two months for another webinar? I can't get enough Zoom, I'll be quite honest with you. More <laughs> Zoom, I say. Um, is, uh, we, INF Australia normally holds a conference in about July every year. We will be holding a conference. Very few of us will get together for obvious reasons. So that's both a problem and a limitation, but also opens up a way of mm -hmm. gathering. Normally we can only have one keynote speaker from Nepal and maybe one from somewhere else in Australia. But for this conference, we're already gathering a number of keynote speakers from Nepal, a number from Australia. There'll be sessions like the one we've done tonight, topical sessions. There'll be reflections from some current and returned <laughs> Uh, serving volunteer workers in Nepal. Uh, there'll be some reflections on the, the church in Nepal. Mike Frost, uh, who's a um, thought leader in the Baptist community and author on a whole range of uh, topics, but particularly mission and missional communities, will be reflecting on mission and discipleship in our current context. So there's a lot of reasons why it'll be great. I don't have any more details except the weekend of July. What's the date? <laughs> The weekend of July, I think it's 25 and 26. Uh, so a few sessions across that weekend. Um, would love to see you there. So we'll, we'll be sending out the details of that to everyone who's been part of a webinar just to inform you. And you're very welcome to join. Um, yeah, and hope to see you at that or at future webinars. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Go well. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.